Is it an urban legend, born of the far-fetched stories shared between teenagers on a dark night somewhere in the depths of Nu'uanu? Or is it a fact, one that still makes its presence known even today? Tonight, Hawaii's Most Haunted presents the legend of Morgan's Corner. Beyond the cool waters and trade winds of our idealistic paradise is the thin veil which separates our world from the place where the shadows talk back. Welcome to Hawaii's Most Haunted. The spooky story has been told at campouts and sleepovers, in the dark of night, in low voices and whispers. A couple's car breaks down on a dark, isolated road and won't start again. The boyfriend takes on the mantle of hero, adventurer, and says he will walk to go get help, and instructs the girlfriend to stay in the car no matter what. The girl is perceived as helpless and waits within the safety of the car all night, but her boyfriend does not return. She is spooked and hears a scratching or tapping sound on the roof of the car. Tap. 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 She finally falls asleep and is startled by a policeman who is knocking on the window. It's daybreak and the officer instructs her to come out of the car but don't look back as they leave. She looks back anyway and sees her boyfriend hanging from the tree above the car. The scratching was his fingers, scraping the roof. Scratch, scratch, scratch. And the tapping was his blood dripping onto the roof of the car. Drip, drip, drip. No one really knows exactly where this story originated but variations of this popular urban legend can be found almost anywhere. The first documented instance of this story was collected in 1964 from a freshman at the University of Kansas. Since that time, the story has spread far and wide, and now it's uncommon to encounter someone who hasn't heard of it. By the late 1970s, a version of this same story is said to have circulated in Malaysia. Another urban legend is about a young woman distraught over her boyfriend leaving her, chooses a tree at Morgan's Corner from which to hang herself. She hung there for so long that her head separated from her body. People say that if you look up into that tree, she will be there waiting to grab you and that her headless body roams the area. While most urban legends often start out with a bit of fact, stories change and morph over the years we can say for sure that neither of these actually happened at Hawaii's Morgan's Corner, but there are still several events that may be the cause for hauntings in that area. In our previous video, Kalelea Ka'anai, the Battle of Nu'uanu, we discussed the furious battle between Kalani Kupule's 9,000 Oahu and Maui warriors against Kamehameha's Hawaii army of 12,000 strong. The battle raged right through the area that is now the old Pali Road and Nu'uanu Pali Drive as the warriors fought for control of the island. Perhaps there are still spirits of warriors lingering due to the many deaths which occurred in and around that area. On Wednesday, March 10th, 1948, around 11.30 a.m., two prisoners escaped from a work line at the Chinese school on Smith Street near Baratania. The escapees were 21-year-old James Majors, who was serving 10 years for second-degree burglary, and 20-year-old John Palakiko, who was just involved in a recent escape from the Schofield Barracks stockade and had been transferred to Oahu prison following his apprehension. Upon their escape, the pair paid the 50-cent fare for a bus ride up to Nu'uanu Valley. They hid out in the hills that night and started coming down the road looking for food the next day. At one place, a dog chased them. At another place, they got a coconut. Then the fugitives prowled the Midkiff estate, stealing two raincoats and a bottle of citronella. They returned to the hills, but while it was still light out, they again hiked down the Pully Road 
to renew their search for food. They approached the Wilder estate from the direction of the natural swimming hole below the estate during the daylight, and at first thought it was empty, first trying the windows along the bedroom and failing to open any. Both men crept around the pulley roadside of the house and there saw Mrs. Wilder about to begin her evening meal. They returned to the windows along the roadside of the house and succeeded in opening one in a small dressing room on the Eva Malka side near the road. The room in which they entered was locked, so Majors climbed through a 14 by 18 inch air vent to the next room. He unlocked the door and allowed Palakiko to enter the bedroom and they set about searching the room. Mrs. Wilder, hearing the noise, left the kitchen, opened the bedroom door and switched on the light, asking, who are you? What do you want? Palakiko grabbed both her arms and allegedly said, lady, we don't want to hurt you. All we want is some food. Mrs. Wilder was able to struggle free and rushed to the front door, calling out in an attempt to frighten the intruders. She managed to open the door to the lanai when Palakiko again grabbed her. A scuffle ensued, but the 68-year-old was easily overpowered. Majors pulled her to the ground and struck her in the eye. Stunned, Mrs. Wilder was bound and blindfolded with towels. The escaped prisoners then carried the unconscious woman to the bedroom. Mrs. Wilder began to regain consciousness and struggled some more and was struck by both men after being thrown on the bed. Palakiko punched her twice on the chin and Majors slugged her on the jaw. Mrs. Wilder lost consciousness and was gagged with the same towel that was used for the blindfold. From the kitchen, the men took some food and then left the same way they had entered. The escaped prisoners were in the house for approximately 45 minutes. The pair followed the winding road, keeping close to the thick underbrush. They rested under a bridge on Kimo Road and ate some food, hiding the rest. Later that night, they returned to Honolulu in the vicinity of a Chinese language school on Kapena Lane from where they had escaped. Here they remained until Friday night, March 12th. Palakiko and Majors attempted to steal a car and were apprehended by the owner who called the police. While waiting for the police, Majors asked for a cigarette and when allowed to light one, he struck his captor in the mouth and fled. Palakiko was not fast enough and was caught and held. He was arrested at 10.30 p.m. Friday night and returned to Oahu prison to be placed in solitary confinement. At this time, Mrs. Wilder's body had not yet been discovered in her home. Majors fled up Palolo Valley and hid in the hills that night and then made his way down to Kaneohe by hitching a ride. He then stole a meat truck and drove to Waipahu where the truck was abandoned. There, he made friends with an elderly man and passed himself off as the old man's grandson for four days. On Tuesday morning, the body of Therese Adele Wilder, known as Teddy to her friends, was found by Mia Matayashi and Isabella Escalante, her housemaid and her gardener. Showing up early for work in the morning, the pair grew concerned when Mrs. Wilder didn't answer, despite her asking the gardener to come two days earlier than usual. Mrs. Wilder's official death was suffocation her jaw was broken, and the gag further impeded her breathing. When they found her, she'd been dead for five days. The police had few leads. The description of the car along the Pulley Road near the Wilder estate from Thursday night to early Friday morning. A man is said to have hitchhiked along the Pulley Road Thursday night and was picked up in the vicinity of the Wilder estate. His shirt was torn and his general appearance was disheveled. Reports of two men seen Thursday evening between 5.45 and 6 p.m. in the Wilder estate. Police Chief William Ho'opai emphasized, every policeman from foot patrolman on is vitally interested in supplying any bit of evidence which might lead to the identity of this criminal. The Board of Supervisors offered a $500 reward for information leading to the capture of the perpetrator. The Honolulu Chamber of Commerce then offered a $1,500 reward. Police set up roadblocks, questioning motorists who regularly drive over the Pulley Road as to whether they had observed anything suspicious in the area. 
By Friday, March 19th, two leads were eliminated. The hitchhiker with the torn shirt reported to the police station and gave his statement, clearing him of any suspicion. The other clue, the mysterious green sedan, which was seen parked near the Wilder home, was withdrawn. The green car was the closest anyone came to discovering the body of Mrs. Wilder the same night that the murder happened. The car was having motor trouble and parked in the driveway of Mrs. Wilder's estate. The woman inside insisted on going into the home and asking to use the phone. They were talked out of it by one of the two men in the car who said he would hitchhike down the road to town and borrow a car from a friend. The two women and the other man sat in the car for about two hours while 50 feet away lay the body of Mrs. Wilder. The final break in the case came when an officer brought in two raincoats found in the hideaway used by Palakiko and Majors. Palakiko identified the raincoats as those stolen from the Midkiff estate above the Wilder estate. He admitted to entering several homes in the area, including the Wilder home. He said they were looking for food. At the time of the questioning, he was still unaware that he was, in part, responsible for the death of the 68-year-old widow, Therese Wilder. Palakiko was taken back to the Wilder home where he reenacted the events of last Thursday night. Meanwhile, a car was stopped at a roadblock at Kokokahi and Kalania Ole highways. The driver said that the man in the back seat was a hitchhiker who'd asked for a ride from Heia. The officer became suspicious of a bundle at the feet of the man in the back seat and began to question him. Suddenly, the man reached for his hip pocket and the officer, believing he was about to pull a weapon, dragged him out of the car. The man broke away momentarily took a bottle from his pocket, pulled out the cork, and drank the contents. The officer slapped a bottle from the man's hand, and he collapsed. The man was Majors, the escaped convict they'd been searching for. It was found that the bottle from which he drank had contained iodine. He was taken to the first aid station at Kaneohe, where his stomach was pumped, and then to Honolulu, where he was placed in the Queen's Hospital under police guard. Majors admitted that he read the story of Mrs. Wilder's death in the newspapers and confessed to entering the home, overpowering Mrs. Wilder and tying her up before leaving. Far from any kind of urban legend, the true heartbreaking events of the final moments of Therese Adele Wilder's life left a lasting impression on the hearts of those who knew her and the place in which she passed. The Pulley Road was built before the use of automobiles, and like most roads and pathways in those days, it seemed to follow the natural shape of the land. Footpaths were eventually widened to accommodate horses and horse-drawn carriages, and then, upon the arrival of the automobile, widened further and reinforced with concrete and asphalt. The first horseless buggy in Hawaii got off to a 12 miles per hour start with the arrival of C.J. Hiedemann's Wood Electric in 1898. Hiedemann not only established himself as the first automobile owner in Hawaii, but also the first suburban motorist as he made his long daily run from his home in Waikiki to his office as general manager of Honolulu Ironworks in downtown Honolulu. It was October 1899 when the first locomobile arrived in Honolulu to the proud owner, Henry P. Baldwin. Horses seemed quite suspicious and people watched in amusement as the automobile passed them by. Newspapers across the country promised that these new contraptions would replace horse-drawn carriages in the future. Even Queen Liliuokalani owned her own locomobile. On July 3rd, 1900, the Pacific Commercial Advertiser reported, Former Queen Liliuokalani went out in her locomobile yesterday, the first outing of the kind she has enjoyed in Honolulu. She manipulated the levers personally and was attended by a servant. She takes considerable pride in her knowledge of the silent steed. The Queen went as far as Waikiki 
before the power suddenly went out and the vehicle came to a stop. She left her servant in charge of the locomobile and returned to town in a streetcar, thoroughly enjoying the novelty of the ride. As the use of automobiles became more common, so did the tendency for speeding, resulting in numerous auto crashes. This winding road in Nu'uanu, once used by horses and carriages, became a deadly turn that injured countless numbers of unwary motorists and claimed numerous lives. Just above the hairpin curve at the lily pond and waterfall, numerous accidents occurred at a place the newspapers referred to as the death curve. As motorists sped down towards Honolulu from the Pali, they lost control at this sharp turn. In the opposite direction, coming from Honolulu, drivers would slow down as they drove through the twists and turns after the country club road, and then, coming out of the hairpin turn and seeing a short straightaway, they'd step on the gas. In either case, bad brakes or failure to slow down, poor lighting in the area, cars crossing into the center of the road from the opposite direction. There were as many reasons for crashing as there were accidents and deaths. When their cars careened out of control, they'd either hit a tree or roll off the road into a 20 to 50 foot drop. In 1931, the city began to work to remove the death curve by reservoir number two. This reservoir is commonly known today as Ginger Pond. The newspaper reported that the sharp corner just above the horseshoe curve was being trimmed about 15 feet to provide a wider turn. The entire road improvement was the result of intense flooding during a November rainstorm the year before and the need to widen the spillway and divert floodwaters into the Nu'uanu stream. Construction of a bridge for traffic to go over the spillway was included in the project. Going up Nu'uanu Pali Drive and after coming out of the S-turn, passing Ilanavai condos on the right, and then Polihiva Place on the left, the road bends a little to the left, and you come to a short concrete bridge. On the left of the bridge is reservoir number two. The spillway, in case of flooding, runs under the bridge. Just before the bridge is a shoulder area for parking and a clearing that leads to a hiking path. Many people say they get a weird sensation around that bridge and at the start of their trail, they feel sick or even panicked. The sharp death curve that claimed so many lives and the new spillway created after trimming the road is now the start of a hiking area, popular with residents and visitors alike. This is the beginning of Judd Trail. Now. By February 1938, the public is still complaining about the dangerous curves on the Nu'uanu side of the Pulley Road. By July 1938, the Department of Public Works was trying to get an endorsement from the Engineering Association of Hawaii for the revised plans for the proposed Nu'uanu Pulley Tunnel. There was much opposition by the residents on the old Pulley Road, and at that time, there didn't seem to be too much public interest in the tunnels. Public Works proposed that the new route would eliminate the hairpin curve at the lily pond. Traveling along the west side of Number 2 Reservoir and rejoin the present road at the new Waterworks aerator. But still, it would be years before the plans for a tunnel were approved. In the meantime, even though the original death curve was widened, the winding curves on Nu'uanupali Drive continued to claim the lives of unwary motorists and began to acquire a reputation of all its own. In 1938, the newspapers called that dangerous section of road the Morgan S-Curve, named after Dr. James A. Morgan, whose estate bordered that segment. In 1941, it was called the Morgan Estate Curve or the Morgan Residence Curve or Morgan's Corner. A 1950 article called that area both Nu'uanu's Death Corner and Morgan's Corner. The complaint in this article states that for more than 30 years, 
the municipal authorities have talked about correcting this dangerous curve on Oahu's outstanding scenic road. One excuse after another is being found for postponing the work, the latest being an express highway plan suggested by the territory is now in the process of litigation. There will always be considerable travel at that point, and at the present, it is very heavy. The corner as it exists is a death trap. By 1953, the name Morgan's Corner stuck. For years, the territory was working on improving the Pulley Road. There were plans for a new highway that ran from the Country Club Road to Reservoir Number 4, would eliminate commuters and their needs to travel down Nu'uanu Pulley Drive through Morgan's Corner. Work had been delayed from 1949 as the territory became embroiled in a legal battle with Lester Marks over the condemnation of two acres of his property. The proposed new highway would be cutting his 17-acre estate in two with compensation for the condemnation price, $12,000. Honolulu bound traffic cruised up the mountain, through the tunnels, and into Nuuanu Valley before bottlenecking at Reservoir Number 4. Drivers were anxious for the new road to be built so they could bypass the dangerous Morgan's Corner. Between 1949 and 1957, nearly 200 accidents occurred on this two-mile stretch of road with dozens of injuries and three deaths that all occurred at Morgan's Corner. Regular commuters complained about the dangers at Morgan's Corner, blaming the accidents and deaths on those who were blocking the construction of the new Pulley Highway. One letter to the editor stated, Then I thought of the accidents, injuries, and deaths caused by Morgan's Corner. I couldn't help but wonder just how I would feel if I was the one who had stopped the building of the new road up Nu'uanu that would eliminate Morgan's Corner. And then I thought of the young university student killed there last Sunday. I thought to myself that if I were responsible for stopping the new road, I would surely feel responsible for that death and the many accidents that occurred there. Finally, in 1956, the Marks case was settled, splitting the estate. Lester and Elizabeth Marks retained 10 acres on the west side of the proposed highway while the territory purchased the other seven acres, including the Marks residence. Even though the highway plans were approved, traffic and car crashes continued on a regular basis at Morgan's Corner until the Pulley Highway was open. One official sarcastically said the area should be called Morgan's Corner. Nu'uanu Pulley Drive from Carter's Corner above Country Club Road to Reservoir No. 4 was completed in October 1958. Now that the dangerous Morgan's Corner would be bypassed by most traffic, traveling to and from the Pulley would be much safer. Although the traffic through Nu'uanu Pulley Drive was now lighter, there were still a few accidents resulting in injuries and even deaths. But through our research, there were only two incidents that were thought to be suicide in the area. But neither of them were at Morgan's Corner. They were further up the road at, <laughs> you probably guessed it, Judd Trail and Jackass Ginger Pond. In 1991, a badly decomposed body was found hanging from a tree just beyond the trails at Jackass Ginger Pond. The body was thought to be the suicide of a homeless man from Date Street who was recently evicted. He reportedly disappeared three months before he was found. But that's on the trail itself. Remember when I said that so many people say they get a weird sensation around that bridge? Well, on September 13, 1986, the body of 26-year-old Clayton D. Toshi was found hanging from the bridge located along Lower Nu'uanupali Drive near Jackass Ginger Pond. The cable looped around his neck and tied to the bridge suggested he might have committed suicide. The whereabouts of Clayton's car remained a mystery 
and no one could account for how he got to where his body was found. Clayton Darwin Toshi, who lived in Kaimuki, was a sales clerk at Petland at Ala Moana Center. He was reportedly last seen leaving a nearby Keomoku bar alone on Tuesday, September 9th, and his body was found hanging from a bridge around 7 a.m. Wednesday morning. Despite his bare feet and his hands being bound in front of him with a towel, police considered this to be a suicide. A notice was put in the newspaper that the police were looking for Clayton's car, a 1982 Plymouth Sapporo, two-door sedan. The car was silver with a black roof, hood, and trunk, and was highly polished, they said. On Saturday, Clayton's car was found. Airport parking attendants making routine checks for overdue rentals and abandoned cars had logged Clayton's car as being parked before 5 a.m. Wednesday. They notified police that the car matched the description published in yesterday's advertiser. Detectives said that Clayton's wallet was in the car, but his keys and other items were missing, heightening suspicions of foul play. Another request by the police was printed in the newspapers, asking for any information on when the car pulled into the airport and parked. On Tuesday, September 16th, one week after his death, police classified Clayton Toshi's hanging as a probable homicide. Police said that Clayton was last seen by an acquaintance between 1 and 2 a.m. on September 10th, when Clayton and an unidentified Caucasian man were seen entering Clayton's car. It was parked on Kalakaua Avenue near Queen Surf. The man was described as being in his late 20s to early 30s, about 5 feet 10 inches tall, has a medium built, light colored hair, and a fair complexion. He was wearing blue jeans and a light-colored long-sleeve shirt. Nothing more was heard about Clayton Toshi except for a January 2nd, 1987 recap of the 22 unsolved killings on Oahu during 1986. They say that a place will carry the psychic imprint of a person that died there. This may be a reason that area feels creepy or uncomfortable. The next time you take a trip along Nu'uanupali Drive or stop for a hike at Judd Trail or even go for a swim at Ginger Pond, say a prayer for those who lost their lives there and the spirits that might be lingering.